Howdy y'all, welcome back. Let's get right into it. Today we're going to be talking about Halifax, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia meaning New Scotland. There's certainly a lot of points within this narrative that I'd like to touch on today without waxing poetic on each. I'll be making ties to some of my other previous videos with Halifax seemingly being the lightning rod that unites a lot of the most important and seldom discussed history. We will be looking at photographs here of Halifax before the year 1917. We will also be looking at maps, newspaper articles, artistic renditions, and first-hand accounts, all the while briefly dabbling into the tumultuous history of early Halifax and the greater Nova Scotia area. As always, take the current narrative here with a grain of salt, but know that I will try to point out any anomalies that I see. The history of Halifax, and indeed of the greater Nova Scotia area, begins over 4,000 years ago. By many accounts, this history could trace back to 8,000 years ago or more. In this pocket of the world, we have the Mi'kmaq, who thrived in the lands that now define Nova Scotia, undisturbed, verifiably since at least 2000 BC, through roughly first contact in the 16th century. The British referred to them as the Tarentines. Besides the similarity of this name to the Tartarians, more on that soon, we also have the interesting fact given that when the many diseases seemed to unitarily spread amongst the indigenous people of the Americas in 1617, the Tarentines were one of the only tribes to not be affected. Many at that time attributed this to the Tarentines having very similar features to the European colonists, as if different castes of the same horde. This led to the Tarentines becoming one of the most powerful tribes in the far northeast, and one of the first described to possess equal weaponry to the colonists. The French referred to the Mi'kmaq as the Suricoi or the Gaspesians. Interestingly, the Mi'kmaq referred to themselves as the people of the Red Plain or the people of the Red Land. Megu Magi in the Mi'kmaq tongue, indeed, all European scholars attempted to decipher the traditions of the Mi'kmaq. Often, they were met with dual meanings, but agreed that the name referred to the earth, the color red, as interpreted as the clay that they built with, and some even thought the red referred to magic or medicine derived from something in the land. As we look at early artistic depictions, these indigenous people of Halifax also remind me heavily of the Scythians or Tartarians or even the early Turkish tribes we see in ancient artworks and maps. We see the same or very similar clothing, hunting and fishing equipment, huts or temporary housing for travel, temperament and animal husbandry down to the same religious headwear worn by the women. Making things more difficult and creating a dichotomy in the narrative We're told by some Nova Scotian accounts, the Mi'kmaq relied almost entirely on oral tradition, and therefore recording their history was nearly impossible. Yet, as we dig deeper, we find those who claim the history was impossible to recount are the same who ended up trying to conquer the land later. Amongst Mi'kmaq relics, and indeed in the oldest caves, monuments, meeting places, burial sites, and known amongst even the youngest of children in the Mi'kmaq tribe, as attested to by first-hand accounts from the 16th and 17th centuries, the Mi'kmaq did have a rich written language. The Mi'kmaq wrote in hieroglyphic. If you watched my recent video on Atlantis and the theosophical belief it truly existed as an island which stretched across what is today the Atlantic Ocean, then you may remember that not only is it attested to by many ancient scholars that the first language of the world was most likely a form of hieroglyphics, but the Atlantean-minded historian will be quick to point out that these hieroglyphics appear almost in unison in vastly separated cultures worldwide. We've discussed Mayan and Aztec tradition of their societies coming from a faraway land to the east after it fell into the ocean. They wrote their traditions in hieroglyphs. In Egypt, the same. In the ancient Celtic runes and the tales of the Vikings, we see a script which could be seen as late hieroglyphics. Now we go to the far north, the reaches of Halifax and Nova Scotia, and amongst the earliest Mi'kmaq, referred to sometimes as the Tarentines, we see a similar yet highly sophisticated form of hieroglyphs as well. Within these hieroglyphs, and amongst the thousand-year-old traditions of the Mi'kmaq, comes the myth which describes or accounts for the Mi'kmaq and their society. This is known as the legend of Gloskap. Now, Gloskap is not only legendary to the Mi'kmaq people, but a key figure to all Wabanaki people. In the legend, a being known as Tal Baldak created massive humans, first out of stone, but they proved to be too cold. 
he broke up these stones and scattered them amongst the earth, creating mountains and the mountain faces. Next, he formed humans out of plant life or out of trees, which became the early Algonquin or Wabanaki people. The famous giant, Odziozo, was the only creature said to not be created by Tao Badok. Instead, by power of spirit alone, Odziozo willed himself into existence, first just as a massive slab, but eventually forming a face, which extended into a head, then arms, and the rest of the body. However, according to this myth, Odziozo's legs grew very slowly, albeit hundreds of feet tall. He thus had to drag himself across the earthly plain, creating valleys, gorges, rivers, and new land masses in the process. Once complete, Odziozo then turned himself to stone. Tal Badok, using the dust, then created Glozcap and his evil twin brother. In one legend of the Mi'kmaq, Glozcap lays on his back to rest in what is today Nova Scotia. In this Mi'kmaq creation legend, Glosscap lays his head towards the rising sun, stretching his arms as far as they can go. Here, in Nova Scotia, he rests for 365 days, thus creating the cycle of the seasons, or the cycle of one year. From his limbs, all of life is born, including the mother of the Mi'kmaq, who is born from the plant life. In another part of this legend, Glosscap is in fact the creator giant himself, who loves to go around and shape the earth in his own image. However, his evil twin brother does the opposite, attempting to ruin his creations. Glosscap then turns his brother into a mountain. Another part of this legend claims that a giant evil frog begins to swallow all of the water on earth. When Glosscap defeated the frog, water rapidly spilled upon the earth and according to this legend this caused many animals to convert into sea creatures thus creating all marine life however the final and most revealing aspect of this gloss cap narrative is according to the 17th century understanding of the legend and the belief the kingdom of norumbega was actually on nova scotia we're told this relates to gloss cap defeating the frog as according to the myth Norumbega's massive fortified walls and the mountain on which they sit were breached when an earthquake destroyed the retaining wall of the kingdom. This converted a mountain on the east side of the fort into a new channel through which the ocean began to flow. The eastern side of the mountain then became Prince Edward Island and the new river channel passed in between. Now I did a lot of significant research on Norumbega on my last video on the subject. And while we did see a lot of promising results, one thing I never came across was the idea that not only was Norumbega in Nova Scotia, but furthermore, Norumbega was a massive, fortified city sitting upon some sort of earlier structure which comprised most of the land of Nova Scotia. And Norumbega itself was a Mi'kmaq or Tarantine stronghold. A cataclysmic event basically flooded the richest and largest kingdom of the northeastern indigenous people, most likely the same sort of event which caused explorers to begin to head to the new world. The question for me then becomes, what exactly sat in Halifax in prehistory? Can we find proof in Nova Scotia, in New Scotland, that the former Norumbega was here? And is this why the British campaigned so vigorously to hold on to this piece of land. As we dive into the current narrative, the Eurocentric history of Halifax, it begins when the first French colonists arrived to the area of Nova Scotia. They named the area Acadia, and they begin to settle here in the early 16th century. When they arrived, we have wildly varying reports of how many Mi'kmaq lived in the area at that time. Some early reports say, 30,000 Mi'kmaq lived here or more, while others say less than 4,000. To the Mi'kmaq, Halifax was known as the Great Harbor. By the early 17th century, the Mi'kmaq had mostly converted to Catholicism under instruction by the French who had arrived about a century before. The real goal for the early communities of colonists was said to be establishing fishing and hunting grounds. 
However, based off the abundance of star forts, the abundance of massive architecture, and the technology that appeared to already be here, I'd say there were ulterior motives. The British entered the fold after first capturing Port Royal, the capital of French Acadia, in 1710. The narrative makes a note here that while the French created Acadia, the Acadian people, much like the later United States Americans, identified as their own specific group. Furthermore, many small attempts were made by the British to capture Port Royal. However, it wasn't until the Scotsman, Samuel Vetch, personally met with Queen Anne to lobby for a full-scale attack to capture New France that anything of substance occurred. Samuel Vetch was a prominent Scottish businessman with ties to the Scottish elite and secret societies. The British, using forces from New England as well as help from the Iroquois and Susquehannock Native Americans, attacked Acadia, which included the vast population of the Mi'kmaq people at that time. The British then captured the store fort and capital city of Acadia. After capturing Port Royal, eventually the British ventured out to Halifax, under campaign by Edward Cornwallis. The Protestant British settling in the region led to the Catholic French and Mi'kmaq people declaring war. Known as the Anglo-Mi'kmaq War, it was fought between 1749 and 1755. The details very convoluted, but what resulted was dozens of massive, architecturally advanced, geometrically proportioned, strategically placed star forts being founded all throughout Nova Scotia. Not just by the French, but also by the British. One of the most impressive resides on Citadel Hill, said to be founded in 1749. It's a star fort built on a previous Mi'kmaq religious site, but what appears to be a giant earthen mound possibly a burial mound. The fort, even in the earliest photographs, appears to be freshly built or freshly dug up, maybe freshly washed, as if it has been renovated continually or employed a cleaning crew. The artistic renditions leave more for us to ponder. Some renditions appear to show a massive statue on top of this fort, itself looking more like a real citadel for worship than one that was built for defense. Others claim the statue was in fact a massive cannon, one which would appear nearly 50 feet. And yet, by the time of real photography, by the time we can truly document these features with less questionable methods, we come to find that most of the top of this structure has been simplified. The walls, still looking fresh, new, as if recently dug up, not built and subsequently buried through years of weathering, and the structure itself as a whole fortified upon the holiest of sites of the Mi'kmaq. So what does this all mean? It means we have a lot of history that's being jam-packed here into one small time period. We have roughly a 20-year period where Nova Scotia goes from one or two large forts to over 100 established forts mostly all built in the star fort variety. And these forts are being claimed or founded by both sides, the French and the British. All the while, the population of the indigenous people is being greatly diminished. This is also when we have European colonists infighting, and this continues to occur for the better part of the next 50 to 75 years. By 1750, Halifax, as it's then known, becomes the powerhouse of the Navy of Britain in the Americas, and the first fire department in what is now Canada was established in 1754 in Halifax. It used a form of Susquehannock or Conestoga wagon. The oldest lighthouse in North America, the Sambro Island Lighthouse was built in Halifax in 1758 and still operates today. The Halifax Naval Yard was established in 1759, becoming the predominant British Naval Yard in the Americas and the site for the British Navy's North American station until the year 1818. On June the 25th, 1761, the official burying of the hatchet ceremony took place between the British and the Mi'kmaq. We're told, however, by the outbreak of the American Revolution, Halifax was almost completely out of money and the town could no longer afford to pay its employees, including no money to pay for the oil or the workers at the Sambro Lighthouse. Again, 
Who builds hundreds of these structures, buildings, opens up this massive port of trade, and builds the first lighthouse ever in America simply to abandon it all after one decade? It doesn't make a lot of sense. We're told the parliament then specifically puts the Sugar Act of 1764 into place, raising revenue to keep the lights on, so to speak. We're told as things would become worse for the British in the United States during America's war for independence, British loyalists would often flee from the United States to Halifax before any other British city in the area. This led to Halifax actually growing rapidly during and directly after the Revolutionary War, and even playing its part as a location where hundreds of raids on the 13 colonies were orchestrated. Prince Edward, Duke of Kent became commander-in-chief of North America while stationed in Halifax and commanded his armies from this location. Prince Edward also designed the Wales Tower, the Halifax Town Clock Tower on Citadel Hill, St. George's Round Tower Church, and the Princess Lodge. Edward apparently built all of these in Halifax in less than one year. Again, the history here leaves us a little bit to question. As we're told, by the early 1800s, the massive city of Halifax, depicted on maps and the architecture shown, much of which still survives today, only consisted of between 25 and 30 unique families living in approximately 60 buildings, including a church, two mills, the shipyard, two inns, and a large bakery. Again, we're told at this time, Halifax had a hard time keeping its residents. There were not enough people to man the businesses of the town, and the Royal Navy headquarters in Halifax did not have enough men to stay operational. This led to impressment, which is essentially the taking of men into military or Navy action by force without compulsion. The British essentially marched through the streets of Halifax, weapons drawn, looking for undocumented men to force to join their army. Again, if Halifax was mostly made up of British people at the time, seeing as in this narrative we're told the earlier Acadians and Mi'kmaq were removed, why were so many of the men in Halifax hiding from the British and they had to be forced into service? Could it be that the population of Halifax at this time was still very much an amalgamation of Mi'kmaq and Tarentine people. Creating further questionability is the fact that multiple resources, including this very same article on the history of Halifax, make reference to how quickly Halifax was growing in the early 1800s. We have conflicting reports, so to speak, which say first, in 1800, there were not enough men to fight. There were not enough men to work in the city's businesses. They were literally dragged from their homes to join these causes, while the other side of the same paper says that during the earliest parts of the 1800s, the city was flourishing, growing rapidly, with the Royal Navy Squadron in Halifax being one of the most feared in the world, leading to the city being considered impenetrable. The War of 1812 brought continued success to Halifax as a location for the launch of nearly every major British naval engagement. When British troops arrived to the American capital, for example, and set it ablaze, these troops were launched from Halifax. After the War of 1812, again, we have these conflicting reports abound. First, we're told a cornucopia of African Americans arrived to Halifax seeking refuge from the United States. These men sought freedom and with them brought new cultures, new beliefs, and they made up a new workforce. However, we're told with the influx of these new residents primed to work and start their new lives, came a lull in growth where the businesses of Halifax began to die off rapidly until the mid-1820s. This is when the history was changed forever by the merchants and bankers who revitalized the Halifax community. Again, read between the lines. Ennis Collins, for example, founded the Halifax Banking Company in 1825, which eventually merged to become the Canadian Bank of Commerce in 1903. With everything that was said to be happening in Halifax, from the Mi'kmaq to the Royal Navy and French Store Force, the creation legends, which tied directly to Halifax, 
and the secret operations of the British, which were launching off the shores of Halifax. The history here is so important, yet so mysterious to me that I find it fascinating that Halifax was not officially incorporated into a city until the year 1842. By that time, we have enough written in the timeline that could fill up two books. And for me, in this discussion, I'm merely scratching the surface of what I see to be anomalies. By the mid-1800s, nationally renowned businesses began to open up throughout Halifax, only expediting the growth. These included the Star Manufacturing Company, the Cunard Line, Alexander Keith's Brewery, and the Morse Tea Company, just to name a few. I find it odd, then, that while playing a key and central role during the 16th, 17th, 18th, and even part of the 19th centuries, by the late 1800s, we're told Halifax took a back burner to other major cities around what today makes up Canada. The Mi'kmaq are credited with having created, or given, the modern game of ice hockey to the colonists. For centuries, the Mi'kmaq were employed all around Nova Scotia, creating hockey sticks and equipment and teaching the sport. Mi'kmaq leaders even met with Queen Anne, the first time indigenous people were taken to Britain to meet the Queen. Halifax did not necessarily lose power in the late 18th century, but rather the power was distributed amongst the businesses and spread out across more of Canada. Halifax played a key role in the Crimean War, supplying many of the soldiers from Canada who fought for the British against Russia. There's even a Crimean War monument in Halifax, the only Crimean War monument in the Americas. Tying this back to Tarentine and the Mi'kmaq people, the last tidbit which really substantiates at least the questioning of the narrative is what occurred on December the 6th of 1917. By the Norumbega account, we can say that all of Halifax most likely has a Mi'kmaq or Tarentine infrastructure, but if we take it less directly, we know according to the mainstream narrative that until at least 1917, a greater portion of the Mi'kmaq people and their relics were in protected lands known as Tufts Cove. In 1917, this was the site of the greatest man-made explosion up until that point in history. The blast, which occurred in the open waters, was so powerful it completely wiped out Tufts Cove and any remains of the Mi'kmaq people from the previous generations. An estimated 2,000 people perished instantly, with over 9,000 more seriously injured. The cause was SS Mont Blanc, a vessel loaded with not only thousands of pounds of explosives, but also hundreds of gallons of fuel. SS Mont Blanc approached the narrows of the harbor in Halifax and collided with SS Emo. Both ships had cut off their engines and were traveling at severely reduced speeds. The collision was more of a bump, very light, which jostled loose the fuel that was loaded on SS Mont Blanc. Unbeknownst to the crew of both ships, when they disengaged from one another, this created a minor spark which leapt onto the deck of SS Mont Blanc where fuel had started leaking. This caused the fuel to ignite and quickly Mont Blanc was engulfed in flame. Knowing the contents that were on board, the captain of Mont Blanc ordered his men off of the ship to try and warn others in the city of Halifax. However, it was too late. The ship and its contents detonated and the greater part of Halifax, including the entirety of the Mi'kmaq preserved lands at Tufts Cove, were destroyed. Any evidence of the Mi'kmaq people, the Tarentines, the original inhabitants of this land, 
of their escape and their culture, their architecture, their history, their hieroglyphs, the protected site itself. This was all upended and destroyed in the explosion. And this caused the greatest loss of human life in a single incident in North America up until the events of the year 2001. The explosion itself has been relatively unmatched. An entire ship, the other ship, the SS Emo, was found carried over the shore, over the river, to the other bay. A multi-ton piece of the anchor was found over three miles away. The impact of the explosion was so great and so massive, for a moment in time, there was actually no water in a specific portion of the river. The water of the river being temporarily displaced by the pressure of the blast. This created a tsunami in the water that not only damaged more buildings in Halifax, it also ended up landing on Tufts Cove where the explosion had damaged all of the indigenous ancestral buildings as well. This massive accident of 1917 completely laying waste to a large portion of Halifax, but why? For the remainder of this video, we're going to be looking at Halifax after the events of 1917. Some of these photographs are going to be taken on the days directly after what occurred, and some will be weeks to months later. But what we will see is that the landscape was absolutely ravaged by what happened. And furthermore, one thing we don't often see photographed in these images directly after what occurred are very little photographs of Tufts Cove, the actual epicenter for what happened. We're told that was the area that was most affected by this explosion, by this event in Halifax in 1917. And yet, when we look at the images, it appears all the rest of Halifax, the European controlled areas of Halifax, were the ones that were being photographed the ones that were being documented. However, when we look at Tufts Cove, when we look at the indigenous peoples, at the Mi'kmaq peoples and what they could have left behind, we don't have any photographs to help us identify what was lost. It's as if this part of the history was tucked under the proverbial rug.